We are finishing up the nervous system with chapter 11, which is the autonomic and motor, really somatic nervous system. I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say somatic systems. Gonna be a short one, yay. All right, areas of the brain that regulate the autonomic functions. One, hypothalamus. Two, pons. Three, medulla oblongata. Hypothalamus is part of the diencephalon. Then you have pons and medulla oblongata. There are respiratory centers and cardiovascular centers. Remember, this is autonomic. Just a quick review. Let's see what the next slide looks like. Oh, yay, I have it. We have a peripheral nervous system. We have a central nervous system. There is exchange, peripheral nervous system, and the central nervous system. This is afferent sensory into central nervous system. This is efferent motor out of central nervous system. So really we're talking about the efferent motor out part. We talked about this, right? With um, chapter 10, we were talking about sensory. Chapter 11 is really talking about the efferent. So sensory afferent, chapter 10, and then now we're looking at chapter 11. Somatic nervous system, this is skeletal muscles. And we really get into this in chapter 12. Chapter 11 is looking at the autonomic. And the autonomic nervous system is divided into parasympathetic and sympathetic. So we have rest and digest and fight or flight. And what does this actually even mean? Well, these are controlling smooth muscles, cardiac muscle, or heart and glands to secrete stuff. So you have smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. And these are controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So smooth muscle, whether it contracts or relax, whether your heart beats more or less, whether you secrete more saliva or secrete less saliva or secrete sweat, this is your autonomic nervous system. And the parasympathetic and sympathetic um, kind of do opposite things. And so the cardiac muscle, smooth muscle and glands have dual innervation, meaning both of them are innervating the same muscles and glands. And so almost all visceral organs have both sympathetic and parasympathetic, and it's designed to kind of fine tune or adjust smooth muscle, cardiac muscle and glands. Dual innervation of the autonomic nervous system, you have sympathetic, right, fight or flight, and you have parasympathetic, which is rest and digest, and they're regulating these organs. They're generally antagonistic, meaning if one system increases the contraction, of a smooth muscle, the other system decreases that contraction. And really it's designed to maintain homeostasis in your internal organs. Parasympathetic, we say housekeeping or rest and digest. It's generally relaxing muscles, slowing them down, maintenance, generally conserving energy, keeps blood pressure, heart rate, gastrointestinal, smooth muscle, normal resting levels, pupils generally constricted for, you know, close-up vision or focusing, 
we call it the D division. This is um, paracynthetics in charge of digestion, defecation, diuresis. That is the job of the kidneys. Filtering blood, right? And the urine filtrate becomes urine. And so diuresis is getting rid of fluids. Sympathetic is fight or flight. Generally exciting things to get moving, mobilizing during activity. So it actually can be exercise, excitement, embarrassment, or emergency. It doesn't just have to be fight or flight. Uh, blood gets sent to skeletal muscles and heart. You're going to increase your bronchioles. Um, so you're going to bronchodilate. So you have more airflow coming into your lungs, more oxygen coming in. Uh, the liver's releasing more glucose. So you have a higher amounts of energy in your blood and gastrointestinal motility actually goes down. Um, so that down arrow is supposed to be here. Uh, this is supposed to be this up arrow. This is supposed to be this up arrow. And this is supposed to be this down arrow. So it gets a little messed up. Sympathetic and parasympathetic, there's usually dual innervation and they're antagonistic. So heart rate sympathetic is going to make your heart rate go up. Parasympathetic just stops making it go up. So it goes back down. Bronchioles of the lungs, sympathetic dilates, makes the diameter bigger, which increases airflow. And parasympathetic constricts and decreases airflow. Right, you don't need tons of airflow if you're just sitting. Uh, the irises will really, it's the um, pupillary muscles. Sympathetic is going to dilate it, increase the diameter, increase light. Why? Because you're usually looking far away because you need to run from a predator. Uh, so you need to see far away. So you're really looking distance. You can have those light waves that are really far away so that you don't need to constrict. Uh, parasympathetic constricting, making the pupils smaller. The anatomy of the uh, autonomic nervous system, it's so just for review, somatic, which is skeletal muscles. There's an upper motor neuron. and a lower motor neuron. So there's only two neurons going out to skeletal muscles. Same thing with autonomic, but it's a preganglionic neuron and a postganglionic neuron. There's still two neurons, whether it's somatic for skeletal muscles or autonomic. So you have a preganglionic and a postganglionic, and in between there's a ganglia. So this is number one from central to peripheral. The ganglion, there's a ganglion is a cell body outside the central nervous system. And then it synapses on a second, right? So here's a cell body of the post ganglionic neuron. And then that is going to basically have a junction so a neural glandular or neural muscular junction with effector organs and also adipose tissue. So there is an anatomical difference, sympathetic nervous system. Uh, the preganglionic neurons are in the thoracic and lumbar area. So they just combine it to thoracolumbar division. They have very short preganglionic neurons and very long postganglionic neurons. The major neurotransmitters of the sympathetic division is going to be acetylcholine at the preganglionic synapse. So that is the synapse between the preganglionic and postganglionic. It's going to be acetylcholine. But at the postganglionic, it's epinephrine, norepinephrine. Remember, that's your adrenaline or fight or flight. Uh, neural hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine. Parasympathetic, these are coming from the cranial nerves, specifically cranial nerve 10, which is your vagus nerve, or the sacral area. So we say craniosacral, very, very long preganglionic, 
very, very short postganglionic, and it's acetylcholine both at the preganglionic and postganglionic synapses. So only acetylcholine. So these are cholinergic receptors. for parasympathetic and they're adrenergic for sympathetic. So these are your alphas and your betas. And then cholinergic would be nicotinic. Well, I would say they're ionotropic or uh, metatropic cholinergic receptors. Parasympathetic, parasympathetic division um, maintains, just as the normal housekeeping of the body, generally most active when you're relaxing reading or after a meal. Blood pressure generally is on the lower end. Heart rate is definitely at a resting heart rate. Respiratory rates are low. We don't need super amounts of oxygen delivered. But our gastrointestinal tract is very active. So the smooth muscle is active. We are secreting salivary saliva. We are secreting digestive enzymes. We're resting and digesting. Pupils are constricted. Lens are accommodating for close vision. And as I said, cranial nerve 10, vagus nerve, is the major parasympathetic nerve going to your uh, internal organs. Also, ocular motor, facial, because salivary glands are controlled. Hair, tongue, and the pupils are ocular motor. There is some sacral uh, down low, but but less. So parasympathetic, you have these really long preganglionic, and then the ganglion is going to be very, um, is near or next to the effector organ. So short, postganglionic, long, preganglionic. That's different from sympathetic, which is fight or flight. We're trying to increase our heart rate, skeletal muscle movement, blood flow, air flow, releasing glucose from the liver, getting energy mobilized. And again, this is in the thoracolumbar area. So the thoracic area and the lumbar area, and there's something called a sympathetic trunk or sympathetic chain right next to the spinal cord. So very, very short preganglionic to the sympathetic chain. And that's where the ganglions are synapsing on long postganglionic. The ganglia are linked together in a chain. So we call it a sympathetic chain. Sympathetic division. There are some effectors that are only innervated by the sympathetic division, which is different from parasympathetic. Everything that's innervated by the parasympathetic also is innervated by the sympathetic, but the sympathetic only innervates the adrenal mandula to release norepinephrine and epinephrine. This is controlled by the hypothalamus. So remember in the beginning where we had the hypothalamus, brainstem, hypothalamus directly controlling the release of epinephrine, norepinephrine, and this is sympathetic, right? Erector pili muscles in the skin. This gives you goosebumps. Those little erector pili muscles. Sweat glands. We sweat under stress, right? Because remember, it's exercise, excite. These are the E divisions. Uh, and then some vessels for vasoconstriction. Sympathetic. Division is going to control your thermoregulatory responses. Um, blood pressure. This is release of renin from the kidneys. We get into this in chapter 18. Uh, also metabolic effects. Um, so it can increase cells doing cellular respiration, increasing ATP levels, 
usually if it's fight or flight, we're going to need more energy to make more muscle cells contract and make more muscles move. And we need more energy from that. So we increase glucose levels and triglycerides from the fat cells. So we're mobilizing energy. If you look at the anatomical differences, this just kind of says parasympathetic versus sympathetic, where parasympathetic is crano craniosacral, sympathetic is thoracolumbar. These are where the preganglionic fibers are, are coming from. You have long preganglionic and short postganglionic in parasympathetic. In sympathetic, you have short preganglionic and long. One other note is that in the sympathetic, Sympathetic division, there's branching, whereas parasympathetic, it's kind of a one to one. If you look at sympathetic, you can have one preganglionic neuron synapsing on multiple <clears throat> postganglionic. So there is a more diffuse effect. That's why when it's fight or flight, we feel it systematically versus rest and digest. Straight one to one. As far as physiological differences, um, parasympathetic has more local control because of that, but because of the diffuse branching and synapse, you're going to have you know, this kind of systemic reaction to the epinephrine, norepinephrine. There's all these branching. Neurotransmitter again is only acetylcholine at all synapses. But in sympathetic, you have acetylcholine at the ganglion and then epinephrine, norepinephrine at the effector. If, if we're looking, well, we'll get to that chart in a minute. General overview, this gives you structure, what the sympathetic nervous system does, what the parasympathetic nervous system does. And I'm not gonna read you this chart, but I would like you to go through and know all of these structures and what sympathetic does and what parasympathetic does. <laughs> and so it goes through a couple of pages and you can read through those. Okay, as I stated before, receptors for the neurotransmitters. Cholinergic receptors are for acetylcholine. <coughs> Excuse me. Cholinergic receptors have two types. Nicotinic, those are the ionotropic. Um, this opens um, ion channels. Right, so the receptor is part of the channel. Versus muscarinic, these are metatropic. These are second messenger system receptors. These are fast to react. These are slower to react. Types of adrenergic receptors for epinephrine, norepinephrine. Again, you have your alphas and your betas, three types, two types. Autonomic neurotransmitters and receptors, cholinergic, those are gonna bind acetylcholine. At the preganglion, you have acetylcholine. They're gonna be nicotinic cholinergic receptors. Nicotinic cholinergic receptors, why? Because they are always excitatory. And so at the ganglions, you always want neuron one to activate neuro, neuron two. So they're always going to be nicotinic cholinergic receptors. They always cause an action potential. But if it's, and by the way, this is parasympathetic. At the effector organ, they are going to be muscarinic cholinergic receptors. They are the metatropic. They can be excitatory or inhibitory because they're second messenger. So whereas these are always excitatory, metatropic can be excitatory or inhibitory at the effector organ with cholinergic receptors. So parasympathetic 
is going to have acetylcholine at the postganglionic synapse. And then at the effector, they're going to be muscarinic cholinergic receptors, still acetylcholine, but different types of receptors. When we're looking at the sympathetic nervous system, it's always nicotinic cholinergic receptors at the ganglion, but they're going to be adrenergic effectors at the effector organ. So they're going to bind, they're going to be alpha zerbetas and they're going to bind epinephrine, norepinephrine. Cholinergic fibers release acetylcholine at all autonomic nervous system preganglionic synapses and then at all parasympathetic postganglionic axons and the somatic nervous system at the neuromuscular junction. So this is starting to get us into chapter 12. So they are nicotinic cholinergic receptors at the neuromuscular junction. Always going to cause muscle to generate action potential. So the somatic nervous system uses acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction and their nicotinic cholinergic receptors. Parasympathetic uses acetylcholine at the ganglion, acetylcholine at the effector, but they are muscarinic, metatropic, which means they can be excitatory or inhibitory. Sympathetic, it's acetylcholine at the ganglion, epinephrine, norepinephrine, whether it's the adrenal medulla releasing epinephrine, norepinephrine, or the postganglionic, and it can be excitatory or inhibitory, depending. And they are binding to adrenergic receptors. So this just goes through again, nicotinic cholinergic receptors, muscarinic cholinergic receptors, and it's telling you it basically, no, let me, let me erase that. That was bad. It's going through this. See, I'm just blowing it. I need to stop. This right here is for here. This and this is for here. How about that? Still messy. Nicotinic receptors found on the motor end plates of the skeletal muscles. This is at the neuromuscular junction. Also uh, on the hormone producing cells of the adrenal medulla. The effect of acetylcholine at a nicotinic receptor is always stimulatory. And so here's a nice little chart. Muscarinic found on all the effector organs of the postganglionic cholinergic fibers of the parasympathetic nervous system effectors, um, and a few sympathetic sweat glands being one. Uh, the effect of acetylcholine at a muscarinic receptor is excitatory or inhibitory, and it depends on the receptor type on the target organ. So this gives you kind of um, a little turn on that. Adrenergic receptors, again, alpha, there's two types. Beta, there's three types. They are all second messenger G-coupled proteins, so they can be excitatory or inhibitory. And so these little question marks are supposed to be the alpha signal here, and that's supposed to be the beta. Properties of adrenergic receptors, they're located in the effector organs of the sympathetic nervous system. Most common, they're usually excitatory, greater affinity for norepinephrine than epinephrine. It's like 80% to 20%. Types of adrenergic receptors, um, the alphas, cardiac muscle, uh, kidneys, usually excitatory, equal affinity for both versus the betas. 
um, blood vessels, smooth muscles, usually inhibitory, greater effect for epinephrine. We're, I'm not getting into the weeds with this, so I don't want to have you think you have to memorize all the alpha and beta adrenergic receptors, but all adrenergic receptors are um, using a second messenger system of cyclical AMP. Um, and so affinities for epinephrine, norepinephrine vary. This our drugs. This chart is really drugs affecting the autonomic nervous system. It is kind of interesting to go through here. Um, different drugs. Maybe you've heard of atropine, um, quantidine. Uh, some of these hypertensives. Uh, Dexatrim was a weight loss medication. I don't even think it's on the market. Or ephedrine. It was basically speed. You know, people took uppers. Uh, we these aren't on the market anymore, so I think it's kind of funny they're in this chart. Smooth muscle autonomic neuroaffector junction. So this is smooth muscle, and smooth muscles as it goes along, um, the the autonomic fiber. There's what's called a varicose, and a varicose is just kind of an enlarged area, whereas the voltage change or action potential comes down, it's going to be a change in voltage, which triggers, you guessed it, the opening of voltage gated calcium channels. And calcium coming in, exocytosis, the neurotransmitter, and obviously it's acetylcholine because it's a cholinergic receptor. And that's going to activate the postganglionic neuron. Or in this case, if it's an adrenergic receptor. So action potential arrives at varicose. Voltage arrives, opens voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium triggers the exocytosis of neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitter binds with receptors on the effector organ you get a response in the effector organ. Then, you know, the neurotransmitter is broken down by acetylcholesterase, diffuses away, is retaken up into the synaptic varicose. Um, when we're looking at autonomic reflexes, and this is one for blood pressure. So say you stand up really quick. Force of gravity causes blood to pull in your foot or your feet. That's going to cause a systemic drop because less volume in the system is going to decrease the pressure in that system. So you have a direct decrease in blood pressure. That's going to cause what is the afferent pathway. You have the regular low frequency of action potentials, but now you have a drop in blood pressure and that's going to cause your sympathetic activity to activate to cause the increase in frequency of action potentials. So you increase the constriction of artery smooth muscle by increasing the frequency of action potentials. And that will then increase your blood pressure back to normal. Last is somatic nervous system. We really nail this down in chapter 12. Somatic is skeletal muscles. Autonomic, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, glands, adipose tissue. Somatic, skeletal muscles. This is your voluntary system. These are your motor neurons. They innervate skeletal muscles. They have the neurotransmitter acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. All receptors in the neuromuscular junction are nicotinic cholinergic receptors. This, by the way, is where the nervous system meets the muscular system. It is the junction of the nervous system and the muscle. Somatic versus autonomic. So here's where we get somatic versus autonomic. And we have gone through this before. Still, there's two neurons. You have an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. 
this right here is the lower motor neuron because the upper motor neuron synapsed on the lower motor neuron in the central nervous system or spinal cord. Heavily myelinated releases acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. They are nicotinic cholinergic receptors, always going to excite the muscle to contract. Again, we went through the two neuron chains for the autonomic. Somatic nervous system is set up in units. So you have a muscle and the muscle has bundles of muscle fibers, which are the cells. And those are called muscle fascicles. So there's like a whole bunch. And a muscle. And then we look at a muscle fiber, which is a cell. And that muscle fiber connects to a motor neuron. at the neuromuscular junction. Here's the thing though, that motor neuron, that lower motor neuron branches and thus forms neuromuscular junctions with multiple muscle fibers. And so that is what's referred to as a motor unit. A motor unit is one motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers it innervates or has a neuromuscular junction with. So you can have one motor neuron and it branches to hundreds of muscle fibers. That one motor neuron has an action potential go down and it's going to excite every single one of those muscle fibers in that motor unit. And so one muscle has several to hundreds of motor units. It's a way we can control really the force and tension that we produce in our muscles. We don't activate all of our motor units at the same time. It also decreases the number of upper motor neurons we need and lower motor neurons we need, depending on the muscle. We have big muscles, you know, your quadriceps. You don't need a one for one. You just need one motor neuron to excite hundreds of muscle fibers because your quadriceps extend the knee. There's not any real variation there. So motor units kind of cut down the amount of neurons that we need to control these skeletal muscles. Uh, and But we need lots of motor units because we don't always want every single muscle fiber to contract at the same time. So motor units are a great thing. Communication at the neuromuscular junction. Again, this is going to be a lower motor neuron. The action potential is coming down the lower motor neuron. Change in voltage arrives, opens up voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium comes in causes exocytosis of neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And this is at the neuromuscular junction. So this right here is the neuromuscular junction. And it is on the level of the skeletal muscle. So each skeletal muscle has one neuromuscular junction. Action potential arrives at the neuromuscular junction. There's a change in voltage in the terminal, axon terminal opens voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium comes in, increases the concentration of calcium, which causes the exocytosis of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft.
this is going to be what's called the motor end plate. on the muscle fiber. And that is where we have the nicotinic cholinergic, cholinergic receptors for acetylcholine, which is the neurotransmitter. So acetylcholine has two possible binding sites on this nicotinic cholinergic receptor. It's going to open the ion channel. Sodium is going to come in and it's going to cause depolarization. of muscle fiber, which generates an action potential in the muscle fiber. Acetylcholine on a nicotinic cholinergic receptor, always excitatory. So at a neural muscular junction, acetylcholine is always gonna cause depolarization or an electrical impulse to be generated in the skeletal muscle fiber. Net movement of positive charge increases depolarization, causes an action potential to be generated in the muscle cell or muscle fiber. That electrical current or action potential, same thing travels down the transverse tubules or T-tubules of the muscle fiber. So you will see this in chapter 12. So when it says spreads through the muscle, that action potential or current is traveling through the transverse tubules of the muscle. So again, go through those steps. Acetylcholine is going to be broken down by acetylcholesterase, which is the enzyme just waiting to break down acetylcholine. And it can be taken reuptake molecule or diffuses away. So same same system that we've gone over when it comes to neurotransmitters. That is going to wrap it up. We're going to start in chapter 12 after we take the exam on the nervous system. I'm going to save this neuromuscular junction for uh, the unit three exam, but I am getting you primed because they do cover it in chapter 11.